Hi, everybody. Welcome to our new webinar. Today, we're going to talk about these amazing and exclusive experiences that we have as Tropic called uh, May I Introduce You to Experiences. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Diego Escobar, a commercial manager of Tropic Ecuador. And today, I'm pleased to have uh, Jasivan Carvalho, our general manager, who will explain you more about these incredible experiences. Hi, Jesse. How are you doing? Hey, Diego. Good morning. How are you? I don't know if you noticed this morning, it seems like summer arrived in Quito and in the Andes. I had this amazing little breeze uh, coming from the mountains and the beautiful sunshine. So I'm getting very excited about uh, the warm, sunny, beautiful views uh, season while the lockdown seems to be easing in the next couple of weeks, we will be able to enjoy more, a little bit more the outdoors and start uh, exploring again. Well, Diego, thank you very much for organizing another really cool topic and webinar. It's been awesome to, to go about uh, the different worlds of Ecuador on your company, going from the Galapagos, uh, then to the Amazon, uh, exploring the Pacific coast with Carlos and his new venture with Contiki, and finally having a, an awesome adventure trekking with Tad uh, last, uh, last week or so uh, with our Lodge to Lodge trekking. So it's been, it's been really fun. And I really love the fact that now we are gearing towards uh, not only more focused experience that we've been developing, but also I think thematics on, on the, you know, on the things that, that I think we should be worrying a little bit more and, and thinking a little bit more on these mm -hmm. um, restart of our operations, uh, such as they may introduce you, right? So I think it's, it's, I think it's fun to, to give a, a little bit of background on why we created these experiences, right? As, right. as, you, as some of the people that already work with us uh, know, they may introduce you to concept is, is an idea to, to bridge different worlds, right? It's, it's to facilitate connections between local communities and with local communities. Uh, I think we've been doing it on a very successful way for many years now. We have it, these incredible characters that we'll be talking and sharing a little bit with, with uh, everybody joining us and, and later on with people who watched our recordings. And I think it's great to, to, to share uh, the vision behind uh, this project, right? This is pretty much uh, part of our commitment towards local communities. As, as you all know, tourism generates uh, many opportunities and responsibilities when it comes to our natural and cultural heritage. And first, I think recognizing that we both are, that both of them, you know, nature and cultures and local communities are not just resources that are simply there for us to use. I think our role begins with incorporating those elements into our business plans, right? I think that recognizing that without them, we do not have any business. We, don't, we do not have any, any storytellings, right? We depend on them to, to attract visitors to our destinations. And we depend on the local communities to protect uh, these resources, right? And uh, so we need to, to, to get them empowered and included and benefited from tourism. So that's really what uh, May I Introduce You to Concept is all about. I think that being able to facilitate uh, and, and, and connect uh, our clients with these different little worlds that we have discovered across the Andes and Ecuador. Uh, uh, it's, it's really fantastic. And, uh, and I think that what, what inspired us, I think our, our beginnings inspired us. I think Tropic has been uh, all about sustainable, sustainable travel and, uh, and, and personal connections from the beginning, right? As, as uh, I've been telling everybody and sharing everybody in the last couple of weeks on our webinars, you know, our beginnings as a company uh, were exactly about facilitating connection with local communities in the Amazon rainforest, working with the Waurani people, the Sequoia people, and the Quechua people in the and the Kofan people in the Amazon. It was always about uh, facilitating for people to explore uh, these indigenous worlds and, and forests through the eyes of the locals, right? So I think that they may introduce you. It's really about uh, uh, facilitating for people to understand a destination or a culture or a natural area 
through the eyes of the locals, being inspired by their stories and by their crafts, right? So, so along with, with the Waurani, we moved to, to a more broader operation in, in Ecuador mainland in the Galapagos Islands. And, uh, and since then, I felt that we needed to engage a little bit more in the Andes, especially because of our large to large trekking programs. We, I felt like, yeah, let's hike across these destinations, but, but what's gonna happen in between, right? What's, what's happening while we're having these experiences? And um, so it was, it was actually exploring the Otavalo region uh, that we bumped into, into this incredible weaver, Miguel Andrango, who really inspired us uh, to create this project, right? And we call it a project because the may I introduce you to program, it was not only about uh, bringing people to these areas and, and, um, and letting them just walk into these people's homes and in these indigenous communities or these artisans' homes. It was really a project where we needed to prepare a little bit the locals uh, in order to get uh, these visits from us, right? So, so it was kind of in phases, we went in and we kind of met them, tried to figure what this story was all about, uh, meet you know, uh, guys like Miguel, and then once we had the story and we figured, okay, this is actually on a, on a, on a, tr on a path that we can go across on our tracks, on our, on our visits to a specific region, then um, our operations team went in and tried to facilitate for them to organize their little workshops, right? So some of these houses, some of the work, these workshops were not ready to welcome guests or uh, th some kitchens were not ready to do cooking classes, for example, right? So, so we were kind of went in, uh, explained what, uh, what the experience was going to be all about, uh, gave some suggestions on how we should fix the workshops, and then we offered some assistance. Uh, we brought a writer, we developed the beautiful stories around uh, these guys' uh, lives and, and lifestyles that we are happy to, to share on our follow-up from this webinar. So we wrote the story of Miguel and Maria and Carmita and all of these folks that we've been working with so for, for so many years now. And after that, we, we, we brought some, you know, some little painting. We did a little workshop with the locals, kind of a Minga style work, you know, everybody working together, trying to fix the little workshops. And then we had the experiences developed and we kind of were able to bring people in. And, and we ended up at that stage, uh, creating the, the may introduce you to concept that nowadays is, is you know, the, the Andean weaving workshop with Miguel Andrango. For example, this is now going into the experiences per se and each of these characters with Miguel, we have created all of, actually we have adapted all of our Otavalo programs around Miguel's workshop. So all of our day trips going to Otavalo, we have a stop in his workshop. Uh, our truck, uh, our lodge to lodge trekking in Otavalo on day two, it stops at uh, Miguel's and we actually do a little box lunch uh, while we're sharing with Miguel. And also all of our visits with overnight around Otavalo, doesn't matter which, which uh, hacienda or hotel or eco lodge we're using, would include a visit to the Otavalo indigenous market, market obviously, but then going uh, on the back doors of the city of Otavalo and visiting Miguel's uh, workshop is definitely a must, right? So, so it is included on, on a range of, of different programs we have developed, as you state, uh, Diego, on this, on this particular slide. Um, yeah, just to add something here, Jesse, uh, an interesting fact is that actually all these area of Otavalo in ancient times, they used to have these large uh, textile workshops and in colony times, it was one of the main income resources and also the name of the workshop of uh, Miguel Andrango is um, Tawantinsuyo. That was the name of the Inca Empire. So he's very proud of his roots. And it's a really interesting process uh, to see all the process from, from the wool until they become these very colorful textiles. He mixes uh, um, a lot of ingredients to create this color. So it's quite an experience and it's good to have direct contact or the behind the scenes uh, contact with the people. So that's it. Very true, very true. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. No, it's, it's great, great details there on the experience. And Miguel is a fun loving guy, right? Mm -hmm. He's kind of this very petite indigenous guy 
who is uh, always welcomes you with a big smile and some stories of his travels abroad and, and uh, his questions about who you are, where you come from. So we always encourage our clients to bring, nowadays it's very easy with smartphones to show pictures of where they're coming from and usually that engages into a conversation followed by the hands-on experience with, within the workshop that usually will be accompanied by Maria uh, Miguel's uh, daughter as well as her husband that is actually the one doing all of the weaving that we can see there. And, and this family is probably one of the last weavers doing things by hand. So it's really, really spectacular to be able to see, you know, we're coming from the, the Lush of Otavalo where you have all of these textiles all over the place and all of these people trading the, the goods, but then going in, you know, kind of behind the scenes and seeing where some of this stuff is coming from because a lot of things are, are done now nowadays on, on big uh, factories. Now, you know, having people like Miguel still weaving by hand and selling stuff directly from his workshop, I think it's something worthwhile to support. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it's really, really cool to, to create all of that. And, and, and we don't make it as a, as a tourism trap kind of deal. It's actually, we go for the experience, he will invite you some uh, little juguito, right? A little juice and, and some coffee and we bring our box lunch and we can, we can share for a little while. With, with Miguel, Maria, and uh, learn a little bit about medicinal plants on, on their backyard where they have this little, the little um, huerto, right? The little farm where they, where they have stuff that they produce for their own consumption. So yeah, it's, it's, right. it's definitely a fun stop. And follow, and follow into the same region, right? And, and this is pretty much Otavalo Valley, right? And behind the uh, Imbabura volcano, you have the magical Suleta Valley for the ones who have joined us on the Lodge to Lodge tracking webinar now understands a little bit more about the geography of these beautiful uh, valleys in the northern uh, Andes of Ecuador, the Otavalo region. It's um, in the Suleta Valley, you have this other beautiful indigenous village, tiny little village uh, where Carmita and Jose Maria live, right? And this is another, may introduce you to Carmita, may introduce you to Jose Maria. And these guys are really amazing. With their, with their kitchen. This is actually one of our success stories in terms of uh, positive impact with tourism. Uh, because these, you know, when we came there to ask them if they were, actually it was my mom who recommended for me to, to visit them because we did a consultancy with, with Waponi in this region with, with IUCN, that is this, in, uh, this uh, international um, conservation organization. They were trying to, to work with the local community to protect, uh, to try and, 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 and make them understand why they should be protecting the, and conserving the high uh, Andes and mountains they have in the surrounding of the village because it's, it was the water source for their own community, but also uh, the Andean condor lives in that specific area. So we did a little consultancy and our consultants, including my mom, had to stay in the village and they met Carmita and then my mom said, hey, you should meet these guys. You know, they cook beautiful food and, and maybe you could do something with them, uh, with Tropic. And so we went in and fell in love with this family. You know, the, another, another very welcoming family. Say, so, yeah, we're more than happy to, to participate and engage. It turns out that Jose Maria worked as a chef for many, many years at, uh, in Suleta, right? At the Hacienda Suleta. So he really uh, knew his stuff in terms of, of you know, ingredients and, and preparation and presentation. So all of the work was pretty much done. And we kind of just uh, assembled the whole thing and connected again to one of our programs or to many different programs that we run in this area, pretty much combining a Suleta drop off and visit, you know, a combination of Otavalo full day and then visiting these guys and doing a cooking class with them and then finishing off in Suleta for clients staying for one or two more nights in the Hacienda. We also finish our lodge to lodge trekking, which is, you know, the big prize for the people ending our treks, uh, end up at Carmita and, and Jose Maria's place and, and doing this beautiful cooking class and then celebrating, you know, um, all of the different experiences uh, we have been having together for two days, hiking across these valleys and, and sharing with this family. And, you know, and this, and this is a very hands-on experience. You're pre pretty much uh, peeling potatoes, you know, learning how to, to make ahi, you know, our hot sauce and, and uh, the soup and the, and the trout with, with some uh, sauces that they, they prepare. I'm not great at, in the kitchen. Uh, that's not my biggest skill. I'm really good now after two months uh, in, in lockdown uh, doing, dish, doing the dishes, 
but not, it's still not very good at, at, at cooking. But yeah, I'm very good at following orders. So Jose Maria and, and Carmita will immediately put you to work uh, as they usually do. And obviously sharing and laughing, that's part of the experience, right? Just spending time with them. And one fun fact about uh, positive impact, going back to a success story, is that right now, uh, these guys already built a small accommodation choices, you know, for a sort of a homestay. It's fantastic. They, they, they built a little, you know, I think there are four rooms in, in their house now, uh, apart from their main house. I mean, uh, they have another little house with four rooms, very comfortable, uh, beautiful one. So, you know, for people who would like to stay at Suleta, but don't want the Hacienda experience, but also, but want to have a more of a, an indigenous community, uh, interaction and, and community-based experience. Uh, this will be our base camp to, to spend some time. So yeah, fantastic. These two are really inspiring stories because obviously because Otavalo is so popular, we use them quite a bit, you know? So, so uh, you know, tourism, conservation in action, right? Uh, tourism, being able to go and, and bring in clients and just uh, w within the income that is generated by our own business, uh, we're able to, to bring a positive impact into this into these communities, which is fantastic. Um, continuing the rural area, right? Uh, it's good to keep in mind that we, it all began in the, in the Andes, in the Andean rural areas. That's how the Maya introduced you to programs is started. And uh, Julio is another of, of these characters. You know, Kilotoa region is, is very famous area. You know, this beautiful crater lake at 5,000 meters altitude in the middle of the of nowhere, I would say, right in the middle of the Cotopaxi province, uh, but more looking towards uh, uh, the Pacific coast is right, this beautiful emerald la uh, lake in the, in the middle of the Andes. And you know, and getting, getting there is kind of a detour, right? You have, you're in the Pan American Highway and you have to drive for a couple of hours to get there. And usually because of the, it, it lacks a little bit of a accommodation choices, you know, usually going up there and just doing the hike around the, the crater lake and having a little lunch with the local community uh, close to the to the crater. Uh, you know, we felt like, you know, we could do a little bit more to explore because this area really feels very uh, uh, far out, right? It feels, it, it, the setting, it's beautiful, you know, the whole landscape, a lot of indigenous villages along the way, very simple lifestyle, very rural. Um, so we felt like we have to find someone uh, around here to 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 facilitate for us to connect with what, what goes on in terms of artwork expression mostly uh, and we ended up finding finding Julio Julio Tuakisa in this uh, this this community it's actually very popular for these paintings that you that you can see on this on this little slide that we put together here you know it's a very classic I don't know Diego if you if you know a little bit the details about the type of artwork that they do or the sinner, but they are pretty much uh, trying to combine, mm -hmm. you know, a little fantasy, you know, how they see and how the artist is seeing. Uh, he's called indigenous cosmovision, but with the day-to-day -day of their lifestyle. So usually you will see the mountains and the views and, and people working and, and farming uh, the land with, with some images of, you know, these huge condors and, and you know, um, God expressions and, and, you know, the sun and the moon. I don't know, Diego, if you want to add something there. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse. Actually, yeah, that's right. Most of the paintings here at Tigua, they depict Cotopaxi volcano, that is like the sacred volcano for them, and also the condor. They are almost um, every painting that you will find in Tigua. And also this kind of uh, art style, they call, they call it a naive style because it's so spontaneous, it's the daily life that, that they see and they represent with these um, bright colors on, on the canvas. And Julio Toakis actually was, um, let's say, one of the main founders of this uh, painting style, and he was a, a drummer. And then uh, he said that a tourist told him to just start painting on his drum, and then he started painting on canvas, and that's how, that's how uh, the art uh, was born here. So it's really interesting to know that they are artists and their songs have also followed suit and they have uh, printed some books for kids too with this kind of uh, naive uh, style from Tigua so it's um, really amazing to know him and to try to paint these um, uh, 
Cotopaxi and Condor in naive style. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really cool, Diego. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think that those backgrounds are really interesting and, and adds value, right, to the reason why we should go or, or your clients should be going into these areas and having these kind of experiences, right? And for the ones who, who has, has been, have been in Chilcabamba, our lodge close to Cotopaxi, it was actually thanks to, to our visits to Tiwa and works with Julio in preparation of the May Introduce You with them. We ended up, you know, buying from him a lot of different masks and we ended up writing the stories of each of the animals on the mask and you ha we have displayed in some of these social areas of Chilcabamba. And actually, I have my own Tiwa painting, you know, it's, it's thanks to Julio, it's because it looks nice. so nice, you know, That's you have amazing. Cotopaxi <laughs> on the background, you have some condors and, and obviously Kilotoa flying. It was a complete disaster when I was doing it, but then uh, thanks to Julio, he, he just, you know, so natural, did a, a little, little details here and there and ended up fixing it. And, and I really treasure my, my only painting, the only painting that I dare <laughs> until now to do in my life because I really That's suck great. at this. And, and, you know, and the experience with Julio, and, and this, uh, it's, it's actually a painting workshop, as you said, right? We, we stop at his workshop, he'll be there ready, and everything is really well prepared, you know, the, the, the little canvas and, and the, the painting brushes and the painting, and he will accompany you, he will show you his techniques, he will show you some of his own paintings to, to give some inspiration, and then you go on and, and do your own thing, right? And he will help you uh, fixing it. So it's actually, it's a fun one because you end up with something that you really treasure from this. And you're, remember, you're on your way to, to, to Kilotoa, so you have a lot of time to think about it. And then you'll see, you have those views, uh, the real, the live view of the, of the creator that you're imagining. And usually you will realize that it's even more beautiful than, than you imagined. So, so it adds a lot of flavor to this experience. And and as I said, Kiloto is kind of far out of, of the, you know, the mainstream destinations like Cotopaxi or Tavalo. So, so we usually would combine uh, this experience on all of our journeys down to, to Cuenca, our, our avenue of the volcanoes that combines only the highlights of the Andes. Actually, we call the program like that, would include a visit to Julio. And any, any other tailor-made experience that would go to Kilotoa will be including this experience. And I'm actually now, actually, we'll be talking about this uh, last week on our Lodge to Lodge track programs, that we, the next one, we, I actually have a, a third version of, of our tracking program aligned to, to be, actually as an excuse for me to get out and, and try something new after this lockdown, but it's, we are going to create some sort of, of tracking trip that will go up uh, from, you know, from the Pan-American high, Highway region in Latacunga, all the way up to Kilotoa in a couple of days. And then most likely on the way out, uh, we'll stop by at Julio. So, so I'm really looking forward to it. But this is already working really well. A lot of our clients uh, really enjoy the visits to Julio. So it's really, it's really, it really adds a lot of, of value to an uh, a Volcanoes Avenue experience that will combine with, with Cuenca. You know, as you guys know, our, our avenue of the Volcanoes programs are all of our trips going from, from Quito all the way down to Cuenca and then Guayaquil. Uh, we'll have multiple stops and, and, and you know, and, you know the, the flow is pretty much national parks. We visit Cotopaxi National Parks. We have, you know, some of the indigenous markets along the way, Sakisili, Pujili. You have the cultural experience with Julio. And then down south, you have Chimborazo, you know, the highest uh, mountain in the world measured from the center of the earth. And you have the llama tracks that we actually don't have on our slides, Diego. I just realized that there we have some may uh, other may introduce you to experiences here on this route. We have the Lama Trek in the in close to Riobamba with a local community where we have we visit the Lama Museum and we have uh, some more interaction with the locals down there. And then moving down south, we have you know Alausi and and the Devil's Nose train ride, and then you have Inga Pirca ruins, and then you get to Cuenca. And usually Cuenca is kind of this beautiful small colonial city. Right, and you have this another kind of sort of Quito experience, you know, the city tours and, and all. But the beautiful thing about Cuenca is that you have these incredible valleys uh, just by the city, right? Uh, Gualaceo, Chordelec, San Bartolo, Tsixi, uh, right? These are four kind of indigenous uh, villages. And the funny thing about these communities is that it's kind of home of a different craft uh, that is being developed over the years, right? So, so you have the jewelry maker, 
in, in Guadalajara. You have before, uh, just outside Cuenca, you have the Weaver again. Uh, uh, further down south, you have you know the the guitar maker. You have this guy who makes world class guitars and, and violins in the middle of nowhere, and you end up having you know. Uh, some kind of interaction with him playing the guitar and learning about this, you know, what what are you doing here in the middle of nowhere uh, making these beautiful instruments uh, that are exported all over the world. And then to close the loop, obviously, we have our the beautiful uh, work that the the straw, the Panama hat makers or the or the Tokija hat makers that uh, Carlos at the, at the uh, cruise in the Pacific Coast highlight to us, right? Well, it's not the Panama hat, it's, it's the is it how, how does it call the the paja de toquilla hats right or the straw hat making that uh, most of the finishings and the and the probably the best finishings of these of these hats are made in Cuenca so you actually can buy the best uh, hats in in Cuenca city so that's kind of a full day where you're having these multiple stops and meeting people along the way and learning from them and 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 telling stories and sharing with them so that brings a lot of flavor to this whole full day of driving and, and, and exploring this beautiful uh, little valley. Dale, if you have anything to add, please, please feel free to, to Thank you, Jesse. jump in. Yeah, just want to add that, for example, when you visit uh, Maria for uh, the straw hats, she is also part of, of another ethnic group in Ecuador called the, the Chola Cuencana, that is um, mestizo but just from the south that you can find in, in Azuay province, in Cuenca. So it's also really interesting to see uh, uh, another kind of uh, ethnic group in Ecuador. Also their craft in terms of uh, the straw hats. And you can see also Flavio Jara, who is uh, the jeweler. And it's great to see how they stretch, they, they twist the gold, the silver, until they create these fascinating uh, filigrana jewels, some shapes like animals, uh, plants, different forms that um, you can use as um, uh, jewels, earrings, or maybe just some decorations for your home. So it's an amazing art. And the same with uh, the Icat uh, Weaver, that we have Santiago Jimenez and Ana Maria Ulloa. ICAT is this special technique that you only find in the south of, uh, of the Andes of Ecuador. And they are really appreciated because at the end of, uh, of the process, you got this uh, like a blur image in the textile that creates uh, also shapes. So uh, it's amazing to see how these people have created these uh, special uh, works of art actually and to see them directly in our uh, may I introduce you to experiences yeah Thank it's you. uh these are really fantastic stories and and as i said we have all of these guys uh stories written so they are actually very nice blog posts if you guys want to use for your own uh marketing purposes we're happy to share with them with you guys and i think it's fantastic to to highlight all of these artists right and and the, and, and the truth is that uh, handicraft and this type of artwork, you know, is, is not like flourishing all over the world. Actually, these guys are probably one of the last ones doing things by hand. Nowadays, we're so engaged with technology and, and attracted to other kind of, 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 of crafts like, you know, Zoom and all of this technology we're using nowadays that actually handicraft is, is something that is losing a lot of space in this world. And I feel like we are responsible to also celebrate, right, this, this beautiful artwork. I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually, I'm a huge fan of, of artwork. I have collections of masks from all over. And, uh, and I, I really believe this is something that we have the responsibility to share because this is where the actual stories about uh, our country are and, and can be found by the authentic ones. So with that said, Diego, you know, we have a few more of these experiences in different areas of, of Ecuador. Uh, and the Galapagos Islands as well. We actually started a few months ago, just before we had to stop our operations with a cooking class with a local family going into the fishers, fishermen market and grabbing some of the fresh products coming from the ocean and then taking into this, to this family and doing kind of a little barbecue. And again, spending some time with them and, and sharing stories, et cetera. So, so that was kind of taking off as well. So we will be continue developing these these stories 
as soon as we bump into them, right? We want it to be very natural. It needs to, to be at the right time, in the right place for them to work out. And that's why we're not creating some crazy stories in, in places where we don't go. For example, we work with this community down in Tena where we do the cho chocolate experience, right? In Santa Rita, that is connected to our Amazon safaris and self drives down to the Amazon. So, so there, there are a couple of more that we could, could be sharing a lot. But I think that the, the, the important thing about this webinar was to, to explain the concept of what the mayor introduced you is all about. And due to the success of the rural experiences, we decided to bring the mayor introduce you to, to the cities, right? Now we're doing these urban adventures. We feel like nowadays, uh, you know, experiences are not only happening in, 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 you know, in remote indigenous communities. It doesn't need to be like that. We don't, we don't need to connect only to those kind of experiences to be sustainable and responsible. We feel like, you know, telling more interesting stories, uh, facilitating insider access to, to, to ambassadors of our cities and, and passionate uh, entrepreneurs on their own crafts. I think it's, it's part of, of, of the model that we're trying to create. I think it's part of being sustainable, right? And, and we decided to bring, especially into Quito, a lot of these unique experiences uh, around food, obviously, as you said, Diego, on our Amazon webinar, part of, of the, the, one of the biggest expression of, 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 of our cultures comes through gastronomy, right? And I really love that, Diego. And uh, so I, I feel like it, it applies into all of the gastronomic experiences we are developing. And we're exploring a lot of that into Quito, right? For example, we have the Ecuadorian Flavors, which is a cooking class in the old town of Quito with Chef Edwin. And, you know, he is fantastic. I think it's, it's a very fun, easy to get uh, cooking class, you know, because we, we are doing some high-end stuff with Alvaro, we're going to tell in a little while, we also did a kind of fun Friday with him. But, you know, they are kind of the extremely sophisticated gastronomy that is also very popular nowadays. Nowadays, but also, you know, so more easy to get uh, experiences and also more accessible experiences like this one in the old town of Quito is a fantastic way to combine. You know, you're having these uh, historical lectures uh, on our walking tours in the old town, you're seeing these beautiful buildings and learning about history and all of this, uh, Simon Bolivar and all of these guys that came to Ecuador and, 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 and made our story uh, as it is, uh, you know, and bringing these more modern experiences and flavors and adventures, I think adds a lot of flavor to the experience. But this is, this is actually about the local, the local chef doing it, you know, sort of finding these people with, with a lot of character uh to trying to share with us diego have you have you done uh, one of the empanada classes with with edwin yes for sure just it's quite an experience uh as you said we want to to have these um, original experiences uh direct contact with the local people that is um, working like the uh, chef edwin uh, here you can learn to do empanadas, uh, some typical food, locro, ceviche. So it's uh, amazing. Uh, sometimes in our daily lives, we never touch the kitchen, but this is the chance to to do really easy recipes uh, with um, the host, Chef Edwin, that will teach the best tips to, to get the best results. So an amazing experience. And also it's, um, it's a good to uh, say that the restaurant is located near uh, the Basilica, an amazing neo-Gothic uh, style church that we have in Quito. So uh, you will have uh, fantastic views of the historical downtown in Quito, and then you head to this amazing cooking class. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, and then for for the for the more sophisticated paladars and for people really looking into this. Uh, really high-end uh, uh, kitchen experiences. You know, you have the Terra, uh, as we, we had a very simple and easy cooking class uh, on one of our fun Fridays with Alvaro. But as you, you guys know, this is actually another success story of, of entrepreneurship, right? With Alvaro, as you probably know, Alvaro is my younger brother. He, this is a young chef who worked with one of the better known chefs in the world. You know, he spent a year with the Roca brothers in, in Girona in Spain, uh, perfectioning his artwork and, and, and working with these guys and learning everything that he could there. He also worked for almost seven years at Mani, 
in Sao Paulo, one of the best restaurants in, in Latin America with Elena Rizzo. And, you know, this is, you know, he went on, uh, have these experiences, learning from the best, and then decided to come back to Ecuador. And actually the first start, the first place that he started doing his, his experiments and trying things out were in Chilcabamba. That's actually where we created, uh, not that long ago, the Nuna experience, right? The Nuna, the Nuna kitchen or the Nuna menu, that means the spirit of the Andes, right? And Alvaro went there and he lived in, in this mountain lodge that we have <laughs> with our family for almost six months, right? pretty much reconnecting with his roots, right? This is a guy who lived abroad for 10 years almost. And then when he came back, say, hey, Justin, I'm ready to do my kitchen. I say, yeah, but do you know anything about Ecuadorian food and flavors and ingredients? He said, well, yeah, more or less. I say, well, let's, let's start with that. So he went and did his, uh, his uh, little uh, retreat in Chilcabamba, went and hiked and explored the Pita River and found the fruits and, and the flowers and the plants that he could use on, on the Chilcabamba salad, for example, and then all of this different stuff that he was experimenting. And actually, uh, I gave him the, the green light, taking a huge risk for him to try in his, his first uh, tasting menus with, with Tropic clients in Chilcabamba. And the response was absolutely fantastic from, from clients from all over the world. Uh, a lot of people saying that it was the best experience they had uh, in their lives in terms of gastronomy, but obviously, the setting also helped a lot, I guess, with the view of Cotopaxi and being in the middle of the of this valley of volcanoes and then having this mind-blowing tasting menu. You know, it, it was very unique. And then obviously uh, the fame and, and, and obviously the entrepreneurial spirit uh, brought Alvaro back into the city where we decided to open up a, a kitchen that was a bit more accessible to the local market as well uh, with Terra. You know, Terra is a relatively new restaurant in the in the Quito scene but now now right now is already one of the better known uh, restaurants in Ecuador actually the 50 best uh, contest included Alvaro on their on their prospection that they were doing in Ecuador before announcing that the next uh, the next election of the 50 best in Latin America will be held in Quito nowadays I don't know exactly what is the timeline related to to that uh, contest due to to this pandemic situation but but i'm pretty sure the commitment to make it in quito is still there and hopefully alvaro will be part of this of this celebration and at least and only having the chance to participate for us is already a huge win considering how young alvaro is and how young the terra concept is so going back to the may introduce you obviously uh tropic has insider access to to the terra kitchen we have, you know, a private area where we could do the tasting menus, followed by Alvaro explanation about uh, the dishes. But the dishes goes, uh, they, they go a lot beyond just a, a, a fantastic tasting menu, right? This is really a journey of Ecuadorian flavors. This is a journey of using local ingredients from different regions of, of the country. Actually, the tasting menu has an element of, of seasonality, right? Alvaro will bring some dishes of the season and usually he would combine something specific from a different area of Ecuador for example he would do a dish with with fish and coconut and that's definitely emblematic from the northern uh, Pacific coast right or they will bring some uh, fruits from the Amazon and will, he will create something really unique and special uh, obviously in the Andes with potatoes and all of the stuff that we grow uh, in, in the region where we live so so it's kind of a, a fun, fast, fascinating uh, story of an entrepreneur, you know, his own story is, is really interesting, apart from the fact that he's my brother. And, uh, but also, you know, the possibility to be and spend some time with him, combining, you know, with your uh, city tours of Quito, you know, a walking tour, a half day or a full day city tour in Quito. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic way to end, you know, with a nice dinner in Terra. And then, obviously, craft beer is huge now in Ecuador. Uh, we, we probably came very late on the trend compared to, the, to Europe and the US, but nowadays we have fantastic breweries that are actually now available for delivery. Thanks, uh, thanks God, you know, I've been able to, to order my craft beer on every week here for, for my weekends. Um, but we've been exploring a lot on that because, you know, for, first of all, it's delicious and it's a fantastic way to combine, you know, a full day 
uh, a visit to the middle of the world. There is a beautiful microbrewery very close to the middle of the world monument. So we will combine um, uh, a beer tasting, you know, to, to you know, as a, sort of a snack, a refreshment, but also, you know, having an experience, learning from, you know, a local. As you guys know, every single master brewer will have their own recipes and their own little tastes and flavors. They will, they will add some seasonal fruit of Ecuador. So there's also a way to connect with what goes on in Ecuador. So we believe it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We actually had a, one of our clients did a beautiful program combined with the cloud forest, you know, and she was matching, it was a great idea. She, she was matching bird watching and beer. So they would go bird watching into the Mindo area and then come back and have this tasting menu with different beers and then name their beer after a bird that they just saw. So, you know, there are ways to get really creative, uh, with kind of modern adventures and, 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 be, and pretty much connecting people. Again, we're connecting people again, telling stories and modern stories, human stories. Obviously chocolate, as you guys know, we, we cannot stop talking about chocolate uh, when it's about Ecuador. Uh, you know, with Pacari, Republica del Cacao, you probably have had um, many experiences or at least tried the chocolates. They're really fantastic. You know, Ecuador uh, made a huge uh, push not to have the best chocolate in the world, but, but, but we did a big push to recuperate the best uh, cacao bean, right? You know, it was an upgrade to a mainstream uh, coca plantation, cacao plantations in the lowlands of Ecuador. And the government really pushed and, and the local farmers also pushed to create this upgraded version of the cacao fino. And in order to get the cacao fino, some other entrepreneurs are now making you know, beautiful chocolates uh, and exporting all over the world like Pacari and Republica del Cacao and even Toac. So we have partnered with all of these guys in different moments and we actually have ventures to do chocolate tastings with any of them, depending on the, on the client's interest. For example, with Pacari, we go really deep into the sourcing of their products. So we combine with Santa Rita community. That is actually one of the communities that where Pacari will buy uh, their cacao to produce their chocolate. So we will do uh, a visit to their shop here in Quito, do a chocolate tasting, combined to a visit to one of their farms down in Tena on our Amazon safaris, and then and then create this experience around Pacari. With Republica del Cacao, as you guys know, we actually participate on the development of their uh, cacao museum, right? And that is actually a place where our guides, along with Republica del Cacao, developed the the script for a visit to the museum. We actually don't even need, uh, our own guides know what to do in their museum and tell the story. And we end up with a very nice uh, chocolate tasting, you know, as well as with, with, with uh, Chef Edwin. This is kind of a fun way to bring a different flavor to, uh, to a visit to the old town, right? To combine with architecture and stories and all of that uh, thing. But, you know, going to the, to the chocolate museum with Republica Cacao and having a chocolate tasting is a fantastic way to add a different flavor to the experience. And then connecting with the local chef, they'll be giving us, you know, the explanation about the tasting. And then for the ultimate uh, cho chocolate experience, we partnered with Toac. Uh, that some of you might not know about this chocolate, but this is, this is a chocolate bar that goes for $500 a, a little piece of chocolate and is exported all over the world as a, as a luxury good. Uh, we had the pleasure to meet these guys, you know, and the entrepreneurs that anyone knows why they created their own product, they probably have their demand. But we found this beautiful opportunity to partner with them as well as the, with, the, with the Osvaldo Guayasamin Foundation. And we actually were able to open uh, Guayasamin's home and do a chocolate tasting on his private uh, wine cellar, right? So we, we are doing this private visit to, to Guayasamin's house and learn, well, as you guys don't, if you guys don't know who Guayasamin is, he's probably the, mo the, the most famous Ecuadorian painter and his artwork is, is all over the world, uh, included our Congress, you know, mural, you have on, on Barajas uh, airport, uh, terminal one, if I'm not wrong or four, you have another mural of, of Osvaldo Guayasamin, and he's, uh, he has a museum called Capilla del Hombre that we can include as well on any of, of our more modern kind of experience city tours. But within going back to chocolate and connecting, you have me introduce you to Osvaldo Guayasamin, the most famous painter in Ecuador, and finishing in his own uh, private wine cellar, doing this beautiful chocolate tasting 
that is actually paired with you know rum and or whiskey depending on the client's interest so it's really sophisticated very you know exclusive sort of a experience so i think it's it's, it's a well worth experience and you don't have to buy the 300 dollar uh chocolate bar <laughs> But you you can actually have a, a feel of, of the experience and a taste of the chocolate. It's actually awesome. I had the pleasure to try them all. And I think Toys is, is a definitely worthwhile experience, especially because of the context of Guayasamin and all that, right? So, Dave, I don't know if you have your own favorite uh, chocolate uh, uh, brand and, and flavor, but feel free to add on because uh, we are all chocolate experts now in Ecuador, right? Yeah, that's right. All, all of them are delicious. And actually, it's amazing to think the variety of options we have, like in Pacari, you find uh, chocolate with uh, golden berries, also with, with Andean berries, with uh, lemongrass, salad nibs, um, raw chocolate, 70%, 80%, and for the more adventurers, even 100% <laughs> chocolate. And yeah, just to add that also, uh, when you go to the TOAC tasting, you can, as Jassy said, go to the wine cellar of Guayasamin, where he attended uh, Fidel Castro or, or Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So you will be in the same place uh, as they were. So it's quite a, an experience uh, aside from the chocolate itself. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. It, and, and, and going back to entrepreneurship, as, as you guys know, I, I really love uh, this concept and I really try and support as well as I've been supported by you guys as, as, as clients. Uh, you know, we really feel like we're all connected in a way and, and this is, these chocolate makers, these are all people doing the same things that we are trying to do, you know, through sustainable business models, you know, incorporating local communities, giving them the technical assistance, buying uh, with fair trade prices, uh, the product from them, highlighting their part on the value chain and, and who is behind or from which region, right? Republica del Cacao talks about the chocolate coming from the Galapagos, from Los Rios, from El Oro. These are all provinces in the lowlands. You know, Pacari does the same thing. As you said, Diego, combining with this, these exotic fruits that we have in Ecuador. So it's, it's, these guys are also helping us to tell the story of Ecuador, which I think is, is really awesome. And it's fantastic to be connected with them. And then my beloved Sara, you know, Sara is another person that really inspired me to, to, to create this, this opportunity for our clients to, to connect with local artists and, and, and ambassadors of their crafts. Sara, it's, it's funny, you know, everything is kind of connected to my personal life and I'm very sorry about that, but, but you know, I'm very lucky to have uh, interesting people around me, uh, even when I'm not that interesting. You know, Sara, I'm a, her son is, is a dear friend of mine. And I remember when I was, I think, 16 year old on a little party that we were training at Sara's house, I stole one of their, her most valuable uh, artwork and it was huge uh, um, sculpture. And <laughs> on the following day, you know, she called me, hey, Jesse, I know that you did this. I know you love my work, but you cannot just steal my stuff. So can you please bring it back? So, oh, my God, it was very embarrassing. It's kind of a Jesse moment there. But then, you know, we, we became very close and, and Sara is being being always very supportive to everything that we've been doing and i and we also love uh you know the evolution of her as an artist as well because obviously she was you know a teacher at some point and then a mom of three beautiful kids and then suddenly you know emptiness beautiful gorgeous uh, house with these beautiful gardens and she pretty much transformed her house into a private art gallery right so she invites uh, artists from different parts of ecuador to to, to present their artwork in her house and she sponsors them by, by letting them uh, put their artwork there and invite people to visit her. So usually I'll go to see what's new, what's happening. And then I say, wow, this is so cool. Why, won't, why don't we create some, some kind of experience for our clients going into Sara's uh, home and life and art? And then slowly we did the same thing, tried to create kind of the flow of the experience. You know, Sara will tell, the story of some of her beautiful artwork that have stories about Quito as well. So it's a fantastic way to learn about Quito architecture because Sara has a lot of artwork and expressions that relate to, to some of Quito stories like Diablo de Cantuña and some of these different uh, uh, urban myths that goes around our city. She would connect, but with these beautiful sculptures made uh, inspired on those stories, right? 
one of them is actually actually she created a game and this is this is one of uh, Sarah's Quito spheres this she made a replica of all of the cathedral of Quito uh, spheres and they are all very different in in different uh, designs and um, and the beautiful thing is that she created uh, a story about each you know a kind of a personality game where you know you, she makes you choose one and then you choose this one and then she will read uh, kind of a poetry that she developed on each of these spheres. So it's kind of a beautiful game. A lot of people really, really love that. And they end up buying their own sphere. Like this one, it was my first. I have many spheres around my house, but this was the first one that she actually gave me. And this was the first sphere that actually it was Alegria, my daughter, who chose uh, the design. And we treasure it uh, because it was the first one, actually, that we started talking about. And then, obviously, with Sara, we have done crazy things like, you know, uh, doing kind of a private visit to to actually see the spheres in the cathedral of Quito, like the actual ones, the real ones, and then going into Sara's um, workshop to to do your own sphere, right? So we're doing stuff like that, like creating our, your own artwork. We actually have different levels of of interaction, like just going and visit and spending some time with her, then and, and you know walking around her garden, beautiful garden, and and having the artist explanation but then you also have the the workshop right you can actually go and try and do stuff on yourself right some people are really into that or they would like to you know they have a passion on an interest and then sarah will be available to you know to go and do some clay sculpture with you and, and give you some orientation on on her own techniques or share if someone knows a, a different technique she'll be happy to share so it's you know again going back to this idea of connecting people to to within their stories and interests and, and passions, you know, it's obviously some things are more suitable for families with little kids, like the chocolate uh, uh, tastings with Republican cacao, some other, you know, kind of more adult uh, experience, like, you know, these, these more like artistic uh, expressions and interactions. So, so we have kind of created a mix that would uh, be a good mix for depending on the type of clients we are, we are sharing with. And um, as you, well, as you guys know, for the ones who know me, probably know that uh, I'm a huge fan of, of uh, La Casa del Alabado. This is probably the most beautiful museum we have in the city of Quito, you know, and the biggest private uh, pre-Columbian art collection we have in Ecuador, right? This is a privately owned collection. Actually, two families got together and merged their collections and restore this beautiful house in the old town just by Casa Gangotena, so very easy to get to. And uh, we have, uh, you know, we have been taking all of our clients there for, for years now, but now, you know, we decided to take a step uh, further and made a, you know, a deal with the, with the management of the museum. Actually, one of the owners of this museum is part of our board at Tropic. So we kind of say, well, you, you do whatever you want there. So we pretty much say, well, if we can get insider access, go when, when the museum is closed and have a visit with, with the curator, that's, you know, that would be a dream, you know? And so we are able to, to do that for our clients as well. So it's kind of, you know, again, learning about uh, pre-Columbian art through the eyes of a real expert, it's, you know, it makes a huge, huge difference to, to, to a client's experience. So again, for different people who are into different kinds of experiences, you have food, you have drinks, you have artwork, you have, you know, pre-Columbian art. So you, I think it's, it's a very complete portfolio of, of experiences in, like I said, more modern adventures combined with the rural and more, um, indigenous, maybe indigenous community type of, of experiences. Um, along with this, with this kind of, uh, of modern adventures, you know, we know that the Galapagos is kind of the dream trip for, for many people, you know, like your, your Africa safari where you buy these big uh, lenses and, and fancy cameras to get your best shots of the wildlife. And then suddenly you get uh, uh, your equipment from your uh, supplier of, of, of trust and then suddenly you have no idea how to use the camera, right? You pretty much put everything on auto and just take the photos that the camera decides to take. And then for that, we, we thought it was really cool to make a kind of a photography workshop and safari in the city of Quito for people to get used to their cameras or learn how to take better cameras with their smartphones. So we have a partner with these, with these incredible photographers, young photographers that are doing you know, wildlife safaris as well, but we convinced them to help us out in Quito so we have them for a kind of a private uh, class of photography in 
the surroundings of Quito, right? The viewpoint, so we can, you can have bird's eye view of the old town, but then the little details in the old town as well. It's very photogenic uh, uh, part of the city. So it's, and with a clear day, you also have the volcanoes in the background. So it's really fantastic. So, so that's another really cool adventure there for people to book and connect, again, connect with, with a local, learn from their skills, learn about their art and their passion uh, with photography. You know, it's, 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 it makes a huge difference, right? And if you have a common interest, even better, you could spend the whole day talking about what you, what you love the most. So, so yeah, kind of in a, in a, a Diego, I, I didn't think we were able to talk about the May introduce you in one hour. I thought it was, I, and I told Diego, well, this is going to be a short one. And we ended up speaking for, for an hour about these places that we love so much. And, and I think it's a great introduction for people to understand better what to expect from all of these experiences that we have on our, on our portfolio of, 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 of experiences, people to understand the background, the stories and what they can get. I think it's, it's really useful. So. Yeah, Diego. So a little Thank bit of us. Yeah. I don't know if you want to take over, Diego. Uh, and yeah. Wrap up. It was a, a really good presentation and, and introduction to these special experiences. And yeah, just to let you know that we are here, ready in Quito, our offices. You can see our team in Quito and Galapagos, and ready to answer any question or doubt you might have about these or other programs. Always uh, happy to to have contact with you and design a special itineraries for your clients. So thank you, Jesse. It was a, a great presentation and um, stay tuned for next webinar. It would be on June 8th and we are going to have a sustainability forum in Ecuador with Jesse and Tad from Cusini. Awesome, Diego. Thank you very much, guys. Have a wonderful day and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.